everyone. All right, so I'm Rachel Reese. I am going to speak today on reactive services. And by that, I mean the guidelines that have been laid down in the reactive manifesto. So first, I want to start uh, by turning this on. There we go. So I work at jet.com. We use a lot of services. We have a microservice architecture. We have about 300 of them, but this is our site. We are, uh, we launched in July. We are taking on Amazon. We are going to be an e-commerce site. So far, just in the US, but eventually the world. <laughs> I promise. Uh, we have about four and a half million uh, products on our website. We've been featured in the, in the Android store, the app store for iOS. About 900,000 visits on launch day. So we have a, a pretty serious architecture going on, just so you guys know that you know, what I'm showing you here today has actually been real world tested. These are uh, some of our technology. I usually come off and say we are exclusively F-sharp, and I say mostly. <laughs> uh, the first several parts are several of the things that we use with Azure. We use websites and cloud services, an active directory. Uh, and then some of the F-sharp products that we use, uh, let's see, they're fake and packet, and F-sharp data, and I just had to switch computers or this would have looked a little bit better. I promise it doesn't always look quite this uh, messed up and not fitting in the squares. But uh, R and Python and SAS are our data science. We have Angular and React and Node for our front end. And then this is sort of everything else. You know, we have microservices, we have console, we use Event Store, SQL, obviously, Redis. Uh, so we use lots and lots and lots of different technologies. The main one I will focus today on, though, is F-sharp and reactive services. So to jump back, the reactive manifesto, uh, it was recently updated, I think, mid-last year. It is, you know, now the goals are responsive, message-driven, resilient, and elastic. I'm just going to go through each of these four topics and you know, show you how writing your services in F-sharp helps you actually achieve all of these four things quite easily. So responsive to start. Almost every program has to handle events, uh, whether it's clicks in the user interface, listening to sockets in a server. Events are really a reaction to a change of state. It's something everyone needs to use. In F-sharp, events are first immutable. You know, they don't change from underneath us. They're, they're always the same. And if you have tried to do any kind of concurrency, then doing any concurrent code with mutable data is very, very, very tricky, very hard. So the fact that uh, events are immutable in F-sharp is very important. They also implement iObservable. Uh, events are values of uh, type I event T. Uh, they end up, uh, this is something that a lot of the reactive extensions uh, libraries use. This means they implement iDisposable, so they won't have any memory leaks. They're also composable, so you can, you know, compose several different events, you know, run one thing, run another thing, all very much in order. They're also first class, so you can pass, pass them around. You can pass an event as a parameter in a function. You can return an event as the result of a function. Um, so, composable. This, this bit of code here, um, this operator, first of all, with the pipeline and the, the greater than, uh, those of you who were in the workshop yesterday have already seen it, it is very important to F-sharp. It is the pipeline operator. Basically takes the result, if you've done any PowerShell or any Unix shell scripting, it is the same thing. You take the result of this uh, first bit of code and then pass that in as a parameter to this next part. So, you know, you're, you're taking an event and mapping it, you know, adding datetime.now, and then you're scanning that event for some current information. You're mapping again and scanning, and you can just keep, keep composing these as much as you need until forever, until you get the information that you need. The, the basic bit of code here, what it is doing is, uh, 
It's a response to a button click on an app that will, you know, if you're clicking quickly and the last time you clicked and the current time you clicked, the difference is greater than two seconds, then you'll return four clicks and the last timestamp. Otherwise, you return one click and the current timestamp. It's a toy app I built just to test and play around with apps, uh, with events. It doesn't do much else besides show these two numbers. But you can see how composable events actually are. And in fact, going back to pipeline, the F Sharp community, uh, because piping is so very important, when we redesigned our logo, we actually took inspiration from pipeline, as you can see. So all of these, oops, this uh, map and scan and map and add that we have, these are all called combinators. Uh, so there's, there's many of these, add, choose, filter. You can also create your own. So this using down here, this is a, a brand new one that I have created, and this would be the code to create it. So you can see, you know, we're, we're implementing a disposable. Um, we're, we're checking to, to change the brush color. But basically, we can turn a series of events into an event stream, which handles like an I enumerable. So if you, uh, one of the things that Jet also does is do a lot of event streaming and event sourcing. Uh, has, does anyone else here do event sourcing? Do we know this concept? No. Okay. That I am not going to go into. It's sort of like using just your transaction log from your SQL server rather than using a relational database in its entirety. It's just a uh, write-only, or yeah, write-only, uh, a read-only uh, log of what actually has happened, sort of like an account statement from your bank. So where we can turn a series of events into something like that. So before we move on to, so that is, that is all of events. Events, you know, uh, end up making uh, reactive services very easy to work with. Before we move on to actually looking at message-driven, that is a very big topic, uh, I wanted to look at async workflows. So this is lots of big words. An application of F-sharp's computation expression syntax. Uh, if we want to, uh, you guys should all very much read this blog post. They're sort of, async in F-sharp and async in C-sharp are sort of similar, but uh, Tomas Petrachek actually points out some, some very interesting differences. So before we actually look at async workflows, let's look at the difference between async and concurrent and parallel. A lot of people, um, I certainly didn't have these straight for a long time. Asynchronous just means non-blocking, specifically usually in reference to I.O. operations, but it's, you know, it can be sequ sequential. It's not even necessarily parallel. It only means that it does not block. Concurrent means, you know, multiple operations happening at the same time. Not necessarily in parallel, but maybe a little bit of one happens and then a little bit of another happens, and then a little bit of the first and a little bit of the second, and it goes back and forth. So they're happening at the same time, but not necessarily together. Whereas parallel means, you know, two separate threads, two things happening exactly together. Um, so one doesn't stop to have the other one process a little tiny bit. Um, so asynchronous workflows, it's, it's a way basically to, to be able to take your, your classic non-asynchronous code and very easily convert it to asynchronous code. Uh, it's, it ends up looking very similarly the same. So here we have you know, very classic code we're creating a new web client. We're downloading some data and then writing to an output stream. Very, very simple. If we convert this to an async, we have basically the same thing. We now have a new web client. We now have a download, you know, downloading a string, and then we're writing this out to a screen. Um, this is what that output would look like. But if you notice, the only real differences are this new async block set off by curly brackets. And then this let with the exclamation point, let bang, and that we're adding an async download string instead of a download data. 
let in F sharp is how you uh, declare anything. It is like var or dim. Um, it's, it's how you define both variables and functions and basically everything that you will be working with. Let bang, on the other hand, so let, if you're declaring an, an asynchronous object, will define one for use later, whereas let bang, specifically within this async block, will start that asynchronous computation immediately. There is also, uh, we can take this asynchronous loop here, or this asynchronous workflow, and put it inside a recursive loop. Uh, I know it's recursive because of the rec keyword. Uh, so this is just a very basic recursive loop. I'm declaring, you know, to wait for a, a mouse down, and then I sleep for a thousand, and I, I add one. And I keep, uh, you know, looping through. But again, you know, we have do bang and return bang syntax, and it is, uh, they're very similar. It's, you know, do will, you know, complete this thing and return actually, you know, asynchronously returns. Oops. So now we get to message driven properly, sort of. <laughs> First, we need to also talk about the actor model. The actor model in, uh, it, well, in, in you know, computational theory, it's a model of concurrent computation. So we're talking about you know, concurrency, things that are happening concurrently, uh, using actors with the following features. We have dynamic creation of actors. Uh, so you know, these little pieces that we call actors created you know, as needed. Um, the actors need to know what their own address is. You need to be able to address an, an, ad, an actor uh, by name, sort of. Um, the only way to get to one is through message passing. Now we're finally getting to the message passing part. And it's, there's no restriction on message arrival order. So it can be, they can arrive out of order. But before we go even further, what actually is an actor? That is just a very small teensy bit of code that contains a queue and receives and processes messages. So it's just a little teensy tiny queue that you know, goes through and processes each message as it comes in. Now, uh, one of the, the three people who, you know, created, came up with this theory, Carl Hewitt, actually said, one actor is no actor. They need to come in systems. So, if you look at the subway map for Tokyo, I always thought this was a good example of what a system of actors should look like. If you think about each station as an actor, and the trains coming in as the messages that come in. So a message comes in, maybe some people get off, and that's a partial processing of you know, the, the message that has come in. Some people get off and change trains. Some people will get off and leave the station. Some people will stay on that train and continue further down the line. But each one of these stations, then, is a potential actor. And the, one of the main points is that from any station, you can get to any other station in the whole map. It might take a lot of stops, it might take three hours, but you can get there. And so they are all eventually connected. You can also think of phones. You know, if you, if you have a cell phone, you, you know, the only cell phone in the world, you can't call anybody. The point is to, you know, call somebody or text somebody to send a message out to this other piece of software and for them to talk to each other. So the way that you do this in F Sharp is by using asynchronous workflows. So we have ours here, right inside here. Um, and we have this agent.start and the, the inbox, which is what, you know, is the queue that the messages will go into. It's just like a standard, you know, email inbox, sort of. Uh, and then we have a, a loop in here. We wait for a message to be received. And then in this case, we don't really do anything. We just say, yes, I got that message. Thank you. Um, and down here, you know, for, for all of these agents, just post, yes, I got, I got this message. But this is basically spinning up 100,000 agents on my local machine and, you know, responding to them. So they're not threads. You know, these are much, much, much smaller. Uh, the output here is, you know, literally. Uh, so if we look 
up here, we only print out for every 10,000 messages. So we have agent 10,000 got message, agent 20,000 got message. This happens very quickly, you know, in less than one second, it will print out all 100,000. Maybe, maybe one second, maybe two seconds, but very, very fast. Um, and <clears throat> so this is, this is one way to do this message-driven, message-passing uh, architecture. There are ways to specifically get a reply from an agent. Uh, <clears throat> this is, so mailbox processor is the type. It's um, actors, the, the term actor, the term agent, and the term mailbox processor all are the same thing. <laughs> you can Google for any one of them and you will get all of the same thing. Lots of people will use the word agent. The actual F sharp is called mailbox processor. Um, but again, it is the same thing here. You have uh, an agent start, you have your inbox, you have a recursive loop and your asynchronous workflow. And here, the, the type of message that the agent is expecting to receive includes a type, you know, a string plus an asynchronous reply channel. This is basically the way that you are able to go back and reply, is that you, you send a channel that the agent then can use to reply. So here, when we receive this message, instead of receiving just a basic string, like I did in the previous example, I receive this message and this reply channel. And then I use that to reply. So in this application, it's just a basic, you, know, you run it as a console app, you type a bit, of, uh, a bit of text and hit return, and then the agent will echo that text back to you. Uh, it's you know, received message and your text. It is very simple, <laughs> but uh, basically this, you know, we have a post and asynchronous reply down here so that we know, again, that we need to actually receive this message back. So we can, um, you know, these are, these three things are how we actually are end up getting that reply. You can also scan. So an agent, like I said, has a queue sitting there, you know, several different items, and you can scan that for one particular one that you might want. So in this application, you're spinning up basically, you know, a very quick instance and say, you know, these jobs have started and you're able to cancel them quickly by, uh, uh, by using this cancel over here. So we have, a, you know, an in-progress. So when, when an agent has completed, we look at what the result is. We have an in-progress agent that will just keeps a list of everything that is still in progress. And if we want to cancel that, we do a scan on the in-progress agent. And, you know, again, we have our asynchronous workflow. And we basically do a, a cancel and, and return, you know, yes, this has been canceled. If anyone here has done any Erlang, uh, this, the actor model is very, very common. It is what Erlang was sort of built around. And in F Sharp, the, uh, there is one very major difference in Erlang, from Erlang, that a, uh, folks who have done much Erlang will, will be very upset about. And that is the, uh, the agents do not work across process boundaries. So you have to stay within the same process. And in Erlang, you can talk anywhere, you know, almost in the world with, with your agents. Yeah. But there is an F Sharp library called F Sharp Actor which does allow this, this remote uh, across boundary talking. In most cases, when, if you want to use this, using uh, F-sharp mailbox processors is, is fine. You don't need to, to, to do, you know, use this across boundaries. But if you do need to, it is actually there. So this Cricut library, uh, it, this is, you know, how you would create a very standard actor. In this case, they were actually called actors, but it is the same uh, asynchronous workflow 
we have a name and then what the actor itself actually looks like. So we have a recursive handler, a recursive loop again, and a message handler, we're again waiting to receive a message, and then we do something with that message. So we receive a message, we process this message, and then we return and loop through all of this again. And it's, that is the whole point of, of actors. It's, you know, it's a queue, you have a message, you process the message, you continue to the next one. That is all. <laughs> uh, and then actor.spawn down here is Cricket's way of saying actor.start. And here is how you would send information. So you have a greeter and you have a back arrow to actually send information over. This is a little more complicated, but this is basically how you would do, how you would handle the actual remoting if you needed to do this. Um, you know, there's, there's a way to enable remoting down here, and you have to set up a few things, and then start everything, and you can, you know, handle that from there. Uh, this is an actor that has remoting enabled, and it looks exactly the same. You still have your actor, you still have a name, you still have your body, you know, your recursive loop, your message handler, your receive, and then how to handle the message, and you loop again. So once that is set up, it is very easy to use. So that is how we would do message passing, message handling. Resilient, the third part of uh, the reactive manifesto. Resilient means we need to be able to handle errors. So tasks that are run using um, basically a, a try-catch, we have an async.catch. Um, you can use an async.run synchronously is the first way. Async.start with continuations, the second one, has an exception option. So if something fails and you're using async.start with continuations, then you may continue with that. There's also what's called the supervisor pattern. Yeah. So first, async catch. Basically, this is double checking that uh, this bit of code, you have a very big file, and if you try to access it too quickly, uh, you know, twice in a row, the first, the first uh, thread will still be reading it, and you can't access the actual file. So in this case, you know, an exception recurred from reading the file. Excuse me. And the, where is it? Here. We have an async.catch and an async.run synchronously. And that returns a result, and we just handle... You know, we look at that result and we match on that. Matching is sort of F Sharp's way of doing a switch case statement. Um, but basically, we look at what that result returned. Did it return, you know, an actual successful value and successfully read the file, or did it return an exception? So you can handle exceptions, you know, very quickly and very easily, and with just a couple extra lines of code. Um, and using this async catch by just throwing in this one async catch right here. The second way, start with async that start with continuations. So we have, you know, a, a normal async post and reply with a reply channel here, and we can call async that start with continuations instead of your agent dot start. And we pass a message, and then in the first case, it's a regular continuation if everything was successful. In the second case, you could enter in an exception, you know, go right to a log file or, you know, send an email to somebody even at 3 a.m. and say, you must fix this. Uh, and the last case is if you, you know, if it was canceled midway through. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you, you can also do a start with continuations if you're scanning. And it's the same thing, you know, the first one is when it's successful. The second is if there's a, a, an error. And the third is if there is a cancellation. There was also the supervisor option. And supervisors are, so an agent is its, its own little queue by itself. A supervisor is, is just what it sounds like. It is something that watches over that queue to make sure that it is still running and everything is okay. And it can watch over several. In Erlang, they will often refer to them as parents and children. So, except 
then it gets weird because you also will kill a process. So you can kill a parent and kill a child, and that's not okay. <laughs> F-sharp, you do not kill anything. <laughs> uh, so F-sharp has supervisors, and it will still, you, can, you have to set them up in, yourself. In, in Erlang, it is part of the, the setup. But you have you know, agent here, you have an error agent, and then several more agents down here, and if something goes wrong in this fail with down here part, then we have an, an agent error, and we basically say, post to the error agent that something happened. So it's basically, if we you know, look at the uh, you know, phone and text message model, this is one phone you know, watching another and, and pinging it and saying, you know, hey, we're still working, hey, we're still working, and then, oh, something failed, and now I'm sending a text message to another phone to say, hey, this is, this is not working. So this, this agent here um, in this section basically posts up to the second agent. And this agent, the error handling agent, will handle the errors. Um, and here's a, another example. If we're scanning in this case, and so basically, uh, so we have, you know, if this doesn't, if this can't work, then we, we retry and, and we call this, this action up here, which will retry. Otherwise, we are, you know, going to call this action here, which is right here, and we just print out a failure. In this case, we uh, <clears throat> use a, a run synchronously at the end, but we're, we're just going through and basically handling the, the error the error case within uh, within the agent. You know, this is what needs to be done if if there's an error, post to somewhere else. Uh, don't post to somewhere else. And when you have a supervisor, you just you know you tell the supervisor that something went wrong, and it's the supervisor's job to handle you know what the next thing is. So elastic, elastic is the the fourth. Uh, a piece of the reactive manifesto. And the way that <clears throat> nah, the way that you would want to do this is you need to be able to scale. So when you look at Azure and you see, you know, you, you can scale many things out or up all at once, you have to be able to do the same with agents. Yeah. So <clears throat> this basically, this bit of code will walk through and say, you know, as so, we have three URLs, a Microsoft MSDN and Google, and we have a processing agent that basically, you know, downloads a bit of, you know, a bit of information from the, the HTML, from the, the websites. Uh, but again, you know, we have our, our asynchronous workflow, we have our loop, we, we are grabbing the name and the URL as part of the message, so this inbox.receive takes the message in. We create a, a URI from the URL, um, you know, create our web client, and this is, you know, this the same code from the beginning. We have our async download string here, and we just print, you know, we read these numbers of characters. And then the scaling agent is another agent. So our processing agent is the one that actually does the processing. And our scaling agent checks, um, again, it, you know, it has our async, asynchronous workflow here. And while true, you know, receive this message, and iterate through, so you know we're, we're piping into a list.iterate, so we have a, this list up here of our URLs, the three of them, and we iterate through all three of them and you know, create a brand new agent for the processing agent and then post that information. So this supervisory scaling agent is basically going through and saying, well, we have three URLs that we need to handle, so create a new instance of the processing agent for each of the, the three URLs. Um, and one, one agent can handle Microsoft, one agent can handle MSDN, and one agent can handle Google all at the same time. You know, you create three instances. So if I had a list of, you know, 7,000, I would spin up 7,000 different uh, <clears throat> smaller processing agents and then come back and have 
at, you know, print out all of this information for, for all 7,000. And so there is, there is a very easy way to, you know, automatically scale on demand with, with F sharp. Uh, and this here, you know, we're just, we're sending in that list of URLs. Uh, and I apparently went a little too fast because I knew I, I had a shorter time than I needed. So I'm actually done. We have uh, an extra 10 minutes for questions. Doesn't, so who here, first of all, has actually used F Sharp? <laughs> so that's, I see one, yay. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> um, ah. I tried to go a little slow. I know this is a more advanced talk. I apologize if the the, the code was uh, very much outside what you guys understood. But a lot of it is, at least in the beginning, a lot of it is fairly similar and fairly close to the C-sharp. It's just minus the curly brackets and a few return keywords, I hope. <laughs> um, is anyone here actually interested in F-sharp? Uh, learning more because it is very awesome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so at, at <clears throat> excuse me, at, at JET we actually have, we have about 300, 350 um, total folks working now, about 65, maybe 70 developers who are all F-sharp. <laughs> uh, we started because, and if there are questions, I will take them. Otherwise, I will tell you guys stories. <laughs> yes? Sure. The, the major advantage from F sharp to C sharp, uh, major advantage. There are several. <laughs> um, one of my favorites is just the reduced amount of code. It's a lot, it's a lot faster and easier to just see what you're looking at. Um, that wasn't super clear in the, the first code example. And if my laptop was working, I would show you better examples. <laughs> um, but even like F sharp is, is statically typed, but it has type inference. So you don't have to list out all the type information. So sometimes that's just, you know, you, it doesn't say int, it doesn't, you know, it, it's smaller. But sometimes when you get into really long, you know, funk things, it takes up a lot of space. And so just being able to look at the, you know, three words on a line and say, you know, let function name parameter equal and go into your function, it's just cleaner. Um, and there are a lot of stories about how because there's less code, because it's easier to actually just look at it, but it, there are stories of people having rewritten apps and have no bugs now. Um, there is there is a type in F sharp which is called a discriminated union. It is if you want to use a um, if you have a very basic object hierarchy, so you have you know one base class and three three new classes that inherit from it. You can model that all in F sharp in four lines of code <laughs> rather than all these files. And that's, that's, you know, one more thing that makes it smaller and easier to just at a glance. There are, um, one of my good friends has a story where during his meeting, he was uh, writing up the, you know, discriminated unions and the, the types that they needed for, for the project he was working on. And it, it was in, you know, a shared document and everyone could see. The business analyst came back afterwards and said, can I have your notes from the meeting? <laughs> Thinking, not that it was F-sharp code, but it was the notes that he was writing <laughs> about, you know, what, what this should look like. <laughs> but it was actual working F-sharp code. So it's, it's easy enough to even, so I guess sort of all of that at once is. <laughs> Anyone else? More F-sharp questions? <laughs> We still have 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, um, so I will tell you guys then, I'll, I'll take up another couple minutes if that's okay. Uh, one of the things I was starting to say was the, one of the reasons that Jet chose F-sharp 
was because of the ability to compose the, that first slide I showed you with the events and that just you know pipeline this, pipeline that, pipeline this, pipeline that, all the way down. The ability to be able to do that sort of thing with events was one of the actual main reasons that, that Jet chose F-Sharp. We had uh, our, our CTO heard about F-Sharp and heard somebody say that you know, because of immutability and, and a few other things, it is very good for finance. And so he thought, well, we're going to, to build an e-commerce site. We need pricing. We'll build the pricing engine only in F-Sharp. And so you know, we hired a few, or he hired a few developers. I was not there yet. And they started to get into early wars. You know, this should be C-Sharp. This should be F-Sharp. Everything should be C-Sharp. Everything should be F-Sharp. And nobody could decide. And so we, there were only maybe four people at the company. And they started writing two complete separate solutions, one in C-Sharp and one in F-Sharp. <laughs> and it was that ability to, to pipeline and to compose everything and make it very easy to see what is happening that was one of the major reasons that we ended up choosing. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>